Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Amber Nightingale Sultani, the Associate State Director for Community Outreach with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. AARP Virginia is thrilled to continue our collaboration with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. This collaboration allows us an opportunity to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs that is offered each semester by Ali Mason. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has been a champion of lifelong learning. Our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrews, once said, the eagerness to learn, to pioneer in the development of new skills and new abilities, to broaden the personal scopes of understanding, to freshen the mind with new ideas and new concepts, to achieve new heights of knowledge, has no age restriction. Those words are as true today as when she spoke them in the 1950s. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout your life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. So AARP encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. And I hope today's lecture will do that for you and more. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ollie. Let me call up my PowerPoint. Be able to chance to talk talk to you about one of my favorite subjects. Um, happy that so many other people are interested in it as well. People, I think, in general have. Um, two rather conflicting feelings about maps. One is the comforting, I would say, feeling of looking at maps, knowing, knowing where you are. You're placing yourself in relation to the world. Um, I don't know whether you do this or not, but I find I generally like to turn the GPS on in my car, even when I'm comfortable that I know the way home. Uh, just for the reassurance that home or whatever destination is ahead is indeed getting nearer. The other feeling about maps, I think, is almost the exact opposite. It's, it's the experience of examining a map just to imagine all the places that you haven't yet seen and maybe perhaps will never see. Uh, I still remember seeing on uh, old maps as a kid, even which were obsolete even then, uh, with areas here and there marked in pure white and marked uh, unexplored, or if they were a little more high-toned, it might say terra incognita. And I can tell you there is nothing more intriguing or alluring. Uh, and, I, and maps don't have those anymore, unfortunately. And I have to tell you, I am one of those who suffered very greatly when filling stations stopped giving uh, away uh, free maps because those maps were always my constant companion on long car trips, uh, letting me know where we had been and, and more importantly, what still lay ahead. So maps do these two different things. They steer us back home and just as often they propel us outward, luring us to uh, experience what we have yet to know, to see what we've never yet seen or places we haven't yet been. And both, I think, are very human qualities. The history of maps is deeply in time with uh, human history. As we will see, maps uh, have reflected very much the power of empires and kings. Uh, that was one of their first reasons for being. They also opened the world to uh, commerce and trade uh, and uh, brought the world together in that sense. And they uh, demarked the boundaries of the expanding territory of the known from the vast and fearsome unknown. As is so often the case, we are deeply indebted to the Greeks for some of the earliest records of the history of maps, uh, even though uh, not a single map from that era has in fact survived. It's sometimes thought, uh, in fact, I think I remember being taught uh, as a child that before Columbus and Magellan proved otherwise, uh, most people in the world thought the world was flat. Well, 
Perhaps a few did, but for the most part, as we'll see, the ancients who contemplated the question pretty much supposed that the earth was indeed a sphere. Even though it was unexplained why things on the opposite side of us wouldn't simply drop off, and that was also a, a question left hanging, but the, the first recorded view of the spherical earth is in a beautifully lyrical passage from Plato's Phaedo. Uh, Socrates here uh, is um, knows that he will be dying soon, and he imagines his soul after death flying upward and looking down on earth. And he says, first of all, the true earth, if one views it from above, is said to look like those 12-piece leather balls, variegated, a patchwork of colors, of which our colors here are, as it were, samples that painters use. So he's suggesting that the soul, when it's transported, wherever it is transported to after life, it definitely lives on afterwards, according to him, uh, looks down on the earth, and the earth looks almost like a soccer ball, perhaps. Uh, soccer balls, uh, he, he was saying 12 sides. He was referring to a dodecahedron, which had recently been described by uh, uh, Pythagoras. Uh, the modern soccer ball has a lot more sides, 32 of them, and it's pentagons and hexagons. But uh, in any event, Plato imagined the earth as reflective of his idea of ideals, the, uh, the platonic ideal, as it were, and could only really be viewed from a distance. Aristotle, uh, Plato's partner in crime, student, sometimes student, uh, provided what we might call the first scientific proof of the sphericity uh, of Earth. And what he said is, how else would eclipses of the moon show curved segments as we see him, see them? So shadows during lunar eclipses clearly show that the outline of the Earth is indeed uh, a circle, and so that means it must be a sphere. He also pointed out that different stars were visible in the sky the further south you got, and that was true even going just from Alexandria to Athens. So clearly the Earth was large, but it was round. It was not flat. And now we come to the second century BC when one of, I think, the greatest uh, thinkers of all time, Eratosthenes, is credited with an ingenious experiment for computing the actual size of this spherical Earth. He was head of the Alexandrian Library, and so he had access to, it's estimated, 100,000 books in scroll format. Very learned man. He came from a town called Syene, or Cyrene, and when he grew up as a boy, he observed that that town was famous because there was a very deep well in it, and at one point every year on June the 21st, the sun shone directly overhead and you could see down exactly into the bottom of the well. Uh, that indicates that Syene was in fact on what we now call the uh, uh, Tropic of Cancer. It was as high as the sun overhead ever gets. So he said, let's do an experiment. And so he was in Alexandria, which is uh, some number of miles away. And he said, the sun never gets directly overhead here, but supposing we had a tower and we could measure the angle of the shadow at the exact point of noon on June the 21st, when we know that it is directly overhead in Syene. Since a tower here casts a shadow, he knew from his Euclid, who, uh, by the way, was a um, his predecessor as, as librarian of the uh, Library of Alexandria, he knew that this angle here and this angle here were exactly the same as this angle here. And this is the angle that he really wanted to know in order to compute the circumference of the Earth. So if he knew the exact mileage here, and is presuming that they were on the same meridian, that is, Alexander was directly north of Syene, which wasn't quite true, but close enough, then he could assume that he could measure this angle here and this angle and this side would be directly proportional to this width, which he could measure, and that would give him uh, this 
uh, if you knew this width, it was proportional to this length as well. So the bottom line is just using simple uh, Euclidean geometry, he computed uh, that the Earth's circumference was uh, 250,000 stadies. Now, unfortunately, we don't know precisely what a stadies was, but various guesses have said between 25,000 and 28,000 miles in 250,000 stadies. So depending on which of those you pick, it is either almost incredibly exact or at least within 10 or 15%. So a beautiful uh, experiment here, and I I, uh, I have to tell you this kind of refutes the notion that anybody, uh, at least uh, in the intellectual world, thought that the Earth's uh, surface was flat. He also, by the way, invented the first uh, uh, armillary sphere, uh, although we don't have it, we, he, it was described, and he also calculated the Earth's axial tilt, which is, I think, pretty phenomenal as well. Now we go to a few hundred years later, a man by the name of Ptolemy, uh, not the Ptolemy who was in charge in Egypt, but a, uh, a, a scholar, uh, described in a book called Geography a, the, a world that consisted of three continents, Europe, Asia, and what he called Libya, which is really Africa. And, and we don't have any maps that he did, but we do have the uh, latitude and longitude, and we can compute the maps here. And that was actually done here for us in the 15th century. Um, so this shows a map reconstructed as to what Ptolemy's map may have looked like. Ptolemy listed uh, 7,000 places with their uh, exact coordinates so that the maps could be reproduced. It's really, there were instructions for map makers. And because of that, he dominated map making for the next thousand years years or so. Uh, he also came up with two descriptions of two what we'll call projections. As you know, the Earth is a globe and it is difficult to, uh, impossible basically, to render that perfectly on a flat surface. So producing a map requires some sort of distortion or projection. The two that he talked about, the one on the left here is conic. Uh, uh, conic. It's basically projecting it onto a cone, and that's the map that you see up here. He described a different sort that has curved meridians. Meridians is the north-south lines here, and curved uh, parallels as well. As you can see, he, he had you know, lots of meridians, uh, even 360 of them, uh, far fewer parallels. He basically called out certain cities, including our friend Syene. Um, but uh, projections basically are required to make a map of something as large as the Earth. So you have to uh, uh, do that. And Ptolemy described in detail the technical basis of two projections. Now we go to the 6th century BC, and in particular, a town, the town of Madaba, uh, the map that we have from there is one of the earliest local maps which has survived. And it survived because it was the floor of an early Byzantine church of St. George in Madaba, uh, Jordan. Only about a quarter of the actual map survives, but it is breathtaking. It's the oldest surviving map of the Holy Land as far as, uh, east, uh, west as, uh, as Egypt. Um, it was discovered actually only in 1896, and it consists of some two million pieces of stone put together. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, Dead Sea in the background. What we're doing is looking um, east. This is right here, this football size thing is Jerusalem. We'll take a closer look at that in a minute. Uh, over uh, so. Uh, over here is the uh, Jordan River and the desert beyond. This is actually the floor of, uh, as I said, a Byzantine church. Um, uh, the map faces east toward the altar of the church. And here's a picture of Jerusalem as it's depicted in the floor. He's taken some liberties here, but uh, you can see basically he's imposed a fairly strong symmetry on it. But you can pick out individual pieces. Uh, 
He, the colony to the street may or may not have existed. Uh, he probably put it in just for symmetry, but the Damascus Gate is clearly there, the walls of the uh, Jerusalem, the Jaffa Gate, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, as it existed then, um, the church on top of Mount Zion, as it existed then, and Bethlehem to the south, clearly labeled. All of these things, as you can see, uh, clearly identified and, uh, and helpful for us. So it's clearly depicting a map, but it's a spiritual map. Now, there's symmetry imposed, the scale reflects the religious importance, and uh, it's a spiritual expression really more than a geographical uh, map, quite intentionally. In the seventh century, as we move on, the T map is uh, more or less uh, commonly developed, a TO map rather. You can see it's Based name comes from the shape, and it, again, it divides into three continents, Asia, which is considered half of the territory of the world, Europe and Africa, Europe and Africa obviously divided by the Mediterranean, and, and a larger sea here dividing uh, Asia from, uh, from Europe and Africa. So this is, again, an example with uh, 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 Jerusalem again more or less in the middle, but the TO map was quite common, certainly for symbolic reasons. And you can see the directions, orients as east, occidents as west, and so forth as well. So it was clearly intended to be a map. Uh, this is a quintessentially spiritual expression um, rather than a, a, an accurate uh, map. The surrounding world ocean, as you can see here, um, Similarly reflected way back in an Anaximander, uh, back in 540 BC, we don't have his map, but we have a description of it, which probably looked more or less like the T map, except that Europe is given a little more space, and then the Nile is now the dividing line between Libya and Asia. But again, once again, surrounded by ocean. So that's a an idea that more or less survived for a thousand years. And it's not 100% clear whether it was intended to represent a semi hemisphere or a flat circle, a disc floating on the ocean. As we move into the 14th century, we have the Mappa Mundi in Hereford, England. And this is what the world looked like to a Christian of around 1300. Once again, the basic TNO pattern, although it's now modified for accuracy, this is a map that is large. It's over five feet high. It's on a piece of uh, uh, a single piece of parchment. And it's the largest Mediterranean map that survives, almost five feet high. Once again, centered very significantly here, which is Jerusalem. And you can see more or less some of the other elements. Again, a TNO map, uh, Jerusalem in the center, the Nile, the Indus, Indus Tigris and Euphrates rivers all together. Uh, you can more or less pick out Greece. England is over there, and Hereford is identified, uh, which is the place where the map is. And at the very top of the map, again, east is on the top, there is the Garden of Eden and Paradise with Christ uh, uh, ruling. So that's essentially heaven at the top of the map on the north. Uh, interesting uh, perspective here. If we look at Islamic maps, uh, the first thing you notice is this is upside down from our perspective, all or pretty much all Muslim or Islamic maps uh, uh, from this interval had uh, the south as the top of the map. But you can very clearly see, uh, I've turned it upside down so we can recognize uh, Europe, uh, Italy, kind of crazy there, but the Mediterranean very clearly and the Arabian Peninsula, and all of the other things pretty much laid out in more or less recognizable format. This was a map that was done um, by uh, the Muslim scholar Al-Adrizi for a Christian king, Roger II, king of Sicily. Um, he, he was actually a Norman. His father had come all the way down from Normandy to conquer the island of Sicily, and there, the kingdom had been set up there, and his reign was quite tolerant. Uh, uh, it was an example of what uh, the Spanish called later convivencia, uh, living together, where there was massive tolerance for among Catholics, Muslims, and Jews living together quite peaceably. And this is an example of the cultures of those two kind of combining. 
a, a high mark for tolerance uh, in, in Europe. This lovely thing is uh, a series of six wood blocks. And this is a bird's eye view of Venice from about the year 1500. As you can see, the date is right there. And it is incredibly detailed. If we zoom in, we can see here uh, well, all sorts of things. You can see the uh, Doge's Palace, the Campanile, uh, lots of ships. Um, uh, very much embodying Venetian civic pride, as well as really a pretty good grasp of uh, geometric perspective. Uh, by this time, Venice had emerged as the largest printing center in Europe, and woodblocks was the only way to do a large things like this. But imagine the work that it put into this, first drawing all of it and then converting that to wooden block so that it could be printed. Uh, so it is incredible that these, this map still survives. You can still see one example in, uh, well, one's in the British Museum, as you can see. There's another one in, in Italy itself. The blocks themselves are actually still on view, the wooden blocks that created it. And here's a, a fantastic picture of the most important commercial element in the, in the medieval and Renaissance world, which is the arsenale at Venice. Uh, this was the first practicing true assembly line in history. On a, uh, at their peak production, they could actually produce one finished ship per day, uh, an astonishing uh, figure. Uh, some details, I think, are obscured for security reasons. They didn't want their enemies to know precisely how they did it. Um, but you can see the clear pride that Venetians had in this uh, early depiction of the source of their commercial wealth, not just trading, but indeed the commercial production of, uh, of ships for trading as well as war. About the same time, a little, a little earlier, actually, 1480, 1490, a similar overhead view map, if you will, but really as much a work of art as anything else, was done in Florence. This is the chain map, as it's called, because around the outside, there was originally a, a depiction of a, a chain uh, enclosing it. This is unfortunately a 19th century copy. The original, which is not in color, was destroyed uh, during World War II in Berlin. But we have this copy. You can see very much emphasizing the protective walls of Florence. Uh, you can clearly pick out the Duomo Cathedral. Uh, the Bargello, uh, the Palazzo Vecchio, uh, the Ponte Vecchio, uh, the Dominican Church of Santa Maria Novella, uh, San Lorenzo, the Medici Church, and the uh, Franciscan Church of Santa Croce over on the opposite side of town. All of these landmarks picked out in this. Over here in the lower right, you see a, the artist, whoever, uh, whoever he is, it may be Roselli. Uh, depicted him, depicting himself drawing this very picture. So a fantastic peak of work uh, that is, uh, we're very uh, lucky to have it survive. And about the same time as well, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was indeed uh, producing uh, works of art like this. He was, he did this in the employ of Cesare Borgia, which he, he worked, whom he worked for briefly. Uh, Nicol Niccolo Machiavelli actually set that up. But Borgia was interested in strengthening the um, defenses of, of uh, Imola, which he, he had just conquered, and he had commissioned Leonardo to draw him a map showing the strengths and weaknesses. You can see, again, vivid detail. Uh, Leonardo, among other things, invented a device for measuring distances by uh, a wheel with a little uh, bean counter that would drop a, a bean into a wheel every so many revolutions. So uh, he was able to measure distances uh, accurately that way. Uh, but a stunning piece of work, uh, piece, piece of art, really. Roughly the same time, we have this gorgeous thing. Uh, this is a, uh, let me blow it up here a little bit, a depiction of the world. Uh, by a person by the name of Fra Moro, who was a, a monk. It was actually a monk living near uh, Venice on the island of Murano, 
but despite the fact that it was a monk, it's it, he he clearly placed accuracy ahead of uh, of religious belief. Uh, this is seven feet square. Um, Jerusalem is obviously not the center, so uh, this act this is a relatively accurate depiction for the time in 1457 of of the world. You can see they envisioned it as a more or less a a hemisphere. They had no idea what was on the opposite side of the world. But down here in the lower right, you can see that the suggestion is, this is the people part of the world with land. The suggestion is the rest of the world is basically just water. Um, uh, this was commissioned by uh, Alfonso V of Portugal. There you can see the various elements. Can, there's the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Italy upside down and so on, and, and and the vast continent of Asia barely explored. Alfonso V of Portugal, uh, remember that name? We'll, we'll have coming into, uh, uh, we'll talk about him again. He uh, conquered North Africa uh, on the part of uh, Portugal, was very much interested in exploring uh, a, a Africa, so that he was very interested in maps, and he commissioned this beautiful thing. Uh, this is all hand done, of course, so this would have been as much uh, a piece of art as anything else, but it was done just for the one the one customer, if you will. And there's a comment from the map person, likewise, I've found various opinions regarding the circumference of the earth. Uh, it's not possible to verify them. It's said to be 22,000 or 24,000 milia or more. Uh, according to various considerations. But again, so again, people were speculating about the size of the earth and they more or less had an accurate picture of the fact that it was indeed a sphere. And to prove that, uh, this is actually a globe done before Columbus discovered uh, the rest of the world. Uh, Martin Beheim in, in uh, Germany produced what he called an Erdapfel, which means earth apple. <laughs> and uh, it's the earliest surviving terrestrial globe. And you can see Africa is uh, rather pronounced, uh, but uh, there is water underneath it. That's important. We'll talk about that. On the opposite side of the globe, you can see more or less the East Indies. This is Europe and Africa over here. So there's, there's Spain. So what's intervening between the two is basically no no North and South America, but they assumed that the Far East was much closer uh, to Europe than in fact it actually uh, turned out to be. So we have now 1492, and as everybody knows, that's the year of the discovery of the East Indies, <laughs> uh, the West Indies, I'm sorry. Uh, and that in fact, was the case. Um, if we talk about Columbus, though, we can't talk about him without talk, talking about this gentleman, Paolo Toscanelli, who was a Florentine, actually, an Italian banker. Uh, uh, Toscanelli died in 1482, as you can see, so 10 years before Columbus uh, managed to get his act together. But Columbus actually uh, was, well, first of all, Toscanelli sent a letter to Alfonso, Alfonso the V detailing a plan to sail west to the Spice Islands and Cathay to China. He was sure that could be done. He tried to interest the Portuguese king in doing that. There was no response, uh, but he basically included a map, which we don't have, but we can reproduce something like this. And it's actually not too different from the globe that we just saw. They superimposed on it as the actual North and South America. But the thinking what in Toscanelli's mind was that uh, the island, island of Japan and China were actually within sailing distance of, of Europe. And he wrote a length letter at the same year to Columbus in which he said, the said voyage is not only possible, but it is true and certain to be honorable and to yield incalculable profit, and always important, and very great fame among all Christians. So Toscanelli very much tried to engage Columbus in the activity of sailing west rather than east around Africa 
to get to uh, the Spice Islands. Um, and in fact, we know that Columbus took some version of a map from Toscanelli with him uh, on his trip. Here's uh, another guess as to what it might have looked like. And again, you can see that sailing west from Spain, as Columbus did, he would more or less run into the island of Japan or the Spice Islands or China, perhaps even. So that was Columbus's expectation based in large part on Toscanelli. Toscanelli was too old to make the voyage himself. Columbus stumbled on uh, a new, the uh, a new world, of course, but he never figured out that he discovered a new continent. Columbus went to his deathbed convinced that the lands he was exploring were indeed the Far East. So enter this gentleman. Uh, this is Amerigo Vespucci, a familiar name, is an Italian banker as well, and he was working for the Medici Bank uh, in Seville, Spain, which is where Columbus's voyages originated. He provisioned uh, the first several of Columbus's voyages, so he was the first to hear of Columbus's success in reaching whatever it was. He promptly quit his job banking. He taught himself navigation. He became a far better navigator than Columbus ever was. And he led at least two trips himself, one for Portugal and one on behalf of Spain uh, in the 14 period of 1497 to 1502. And just as importantly, he had two of the reports that he sent to his boss, uh, Piero de, de Francesco de Medici, uh, probably stolen and published uh, without his knowledge, I suspect. But those established that this was indeed an entirely new and previously unknown continent. That was clear to Vespucci because uh, he was a better navigator than Columbus. And that account obviously spread like wildfire uh, across Europe. A Latin translation of it fell into the hands of a cartographer up in Germany by the name of Martin Walzemuller. And Walzemuller promptly, oh, there we see the two letters from Amerigo Vespucci, promptly produced this. This again is woodblock, a giant piece with multiple blocks fit together to uh, create a map. Uh, and you can see it's kind of the perspective is a little bit strange um, because the uh, meridians all stretch out this way so that Europe can be uh, centered. But this is the first map to show South America as, in fact, what it is, which is a new continent. He had to have some sort of name for that new land. And so uh, what he did is basically put the name of the author of this new report, uh, America, not Amerigo, America, because he was looking at the Latin version of uh, Vespucci's letters. So fortunately, he didn't say Vespucci land. He, say, he said America. And that indeed is what this, this map is uh, entitled the birth certificate of, uh, of America because it's the first usage of that term. And it became usage, uh, the usage used by all other map makers as well. Uh, this map, by the way, was purchased by the Smithsonian when it uh, went on the market just about uh, just after the uh, turn of the millennium. And uh, because it was so valuable, uh, the Smithsonian uh, stretched itself and actually spent uh, $10 million to have this. You can see it on display. Uh, not Smithsonian, I'm sorry, the Library of Congress. Uh, see it on display in the, at the Library of Congress today. And it's gorgeous. It really, really requires a lot to look at. And shortly after that, this is 1507, uh, well, actually the same year he produced uh, a, a globe map and they have to be, uh, you know, arranged separately, but he would uh, make a uh, woodcut of a, this on a piece of paper and then these could all be pasted together over a, a round object and, and it would become a, a globe. And as you can see, uh, America, South America does stretch here. There's a suggestion of North America. So that's what's on the opposite side of the globe. Um, that was 1507. 
In 1508, just a year later, uh, he produced this. And notice America is, by the way, no longer named America. He may have changed his mind on that, but probably not because um, uh, up here on the right, we see Amerigo Vespucci pictured uh, very clearly as if that's one of his two sources. The other being uh, over here, this is uh, Ptolemy. So he basically produced this gorgeous map. And this, of course, was, was uh, rather popular. It was obviously astonishing to Europe to know just how tiny uh, Europe was compared to the vast stretches of Asia, this new continent of Africa, and whatever this was going on over here. So that was a major turning point, I think, in the consciousness of Europe. At the same time, or just before Columbus's voyage, um, something equally astonishing was happening. And, and this is, again, before Columbus dis discovered the New World, Portugal, Portugal became one of the wealthiest countries in Europe by virtue of discovering a new route to the Spice Islands around Africa. The first person to discover uh, the Cape of uh, 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 Good Hope at the bottom of Africa uh, is this gentleman. And short, uh, just a year after he did so, this map was produced um, by a German map maker. And again, there is a passage around Africa, although the uh, geography is a little bit <laughs> exaggerated here. But you can see for the first time, there is a depiction of an actual water passage to the, to the east, um, uh, reflecting the importance of uh, uh, Diaz's discovery. Vast commercial opportunities, vast amounts of uh, wealth created here. Portugal be became almost overnight the wealthiest country in Europe by virtue of that trade route. And one image of that Portuguese wealth. Okay, Vasco da Gama actually is given much of the credit for that, but that he didn't until uh, ten years later actually be the first person to reach India around uh, Africa. The Cape of Good Hope, though, was not his discovery. The wealth of Portugal is reflected in this gorgeous tapestry. Tapestries were more valued than any other type of art because they were so incredibly difficult to make. And this one has uh, an amazing map. This is the Portuguese king and queen here represented as Juno and Jupiter. And as you can see, Jupiter's scepter is hanging right over Portugal and the vast continent of Africa now, which is more or less uh, the, uh, uh, I won't say property, but the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, well, I will say, <laughs> I guess more or less property as far as Europe is concerned of Portugal. Uh, uh, Portugal populated towns along the route here and uh, basically uh, enforced uh, trade restrictions so that other uh, countries could not uh, do it. So, uh, Here we have a map that dating to 1502. And as you can see, Africa is, of course, very important. This is a Portuguese map maker, uh, which is one reason why Africa is so uh, well represented there. But uh, the first thing you notice is this blue line here on the left, which kind of cuts across a little bit of the eastern part of South America. And what that line represents is the line between the lands given to Spain to the west and the lands given to Portugal to the east. So because Portugal had populated a part of eastern South America, i.e. Brazil now, uh, the line was drawn by the Pope at the Treaty of Torsidius in 1493. So very just within the same year that Columbus returns with the news of this vast new territory, the Pope is called in to arbitrate the dispute between Spain and Portugal as to who owns the world. <laughs> so uh, the Treaty of Torsidius, uh, sorry, it's a year after Columbus came back, divided the world between Spain and Portugal. So that was interesting and quite important for the time. 
The Pope at the time was Alexander VI, who, as luck would have it, was a not just a Borgia, but therefore Spanish by origin. So he uh, uh, basically uh, tilted towards Spain and uh, had the Pope in Italian at the time, probably would have been a different outcome. But th this treaty worked well for Spain and Portugal for a time. Uh, I would say less so for the British, French, and Dutch empires, and obviously even less so for the 50 million people who were already living uh, in the Americas alone, let alone the rest of the world. Uh, here we have another map at the same time. Uh, this beautiful thing uh, is by Rosselli. You can see that they kind of minimize the distance of the Atlantic Ocean, but even more so they would minimize the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, which barely exists. Um, Rosselli was based in Florida. He was the first map maker that we know of to sell commercially. So this is not just done for a uh, king, but this is actually a produced as a saleable item. And map making became uh, really quite a commercial enterprise at that point. Uh, this 1508 map shows a uh, fairly large North America and a South America still not connected uh, and still largely unexplored. Um, but the, the world is shown as this beautiful oval. This was printed as an engraving and then colored in later by hand. So uh, this is the actually the earliest extant map to show the world in three the full 360 degrees of longitude, uh, even though they've obviously missed a lot of that in the uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, nevertheless, they did uh, consider this a full map of the of the globe. And as I say, an oval projection. They always put because the uh, it's the convention. They always put the winds in the outside of the frame. Uh, this lovely map is uh, by Peter Oppian. Is a German uh, mathematician and map maker. You pretty much had to be both because you were computing each of these points. And it, that's actually quite difficult when the meridians were curved as much as they are here. Um, this is a map which is considered to be heart shaped, uh, cordiform is the technical word. This was uh, Appian was uh, actually he was appointed map maker to Charles V, and Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, could be said to be the person in history who had more territory than any other person in history. Given that he was King of Spain, uh, therefore had all of South America, had a good share of North America to the extent that it had been discovered, uh, was of course Holy Roman Emperor and the king of the Netherlands and, and lots of other things as well, and Germany. So even though Germany didn't quite exist. So uh, uh, Appian uh, did this for under commission for Charles V. Um, and as I say, this is a heart-shaped, even more heart-shaped is this. The heart shape was actually symbolically quite important. Uh, this map is said to be the world as transformed into the human heart, as it says. It's gorgeous. Uh, the colors, obviously. Uh, the uh, uh, There was a, ver a very strong um, demand for heart-shaped uh, maps for a while, and then they kind of fell out of favor. This is a gentleman by the name of Ortelius. Uh, he was from the Low Countries and kind of re reflects the very beginnings of what I'll call the golden age of cartography in the Netherlands. This is uh, the theater of the lands of the world, as he called it. Uh, the Portuguese introduced the scientific craft of map making, but it was the Dutch who turned it into a full up industry. Uh, uh, Ortelius actually produced this world map as part of an atlas, a book of maps. So it's actually the first modern atlas that, that we have, that we know of. 53 maps in total of various parts of the world, and then this one of the world as a whole. And there was, I can tell you, absolutely massive demand for it. Uh, that atlas underwent 25 editions uh, just before he died. Uh, and so obviously many more after that. Very influential and extremely popular. And you can, as you can see, 
uh, the territory in the South is really kind of uh, exaggerated. Um, uh, it's nowhere near that big, of course, but uh, and, as, and the northern polar regions as well. But uh, the territory of Antarctica actually hadn't been uh, technically discovered at that point. So that was a pure guess as to uh, as to whether it was there or not. And now we come to this gentleman, uh, Mercator. I think we've all heard of a Mercator projection. And he was actually the first to solve one of the more obvious problems, which is how do you actually produce accurately a map uh, that should be a globe onto a flat surface? What he chose to do is for the first time straighten all of the meridians and all of the parallels. So all you see here, nothing but straight lines. And if you can imagine that there was a light right in the center of the uh, uh, globe here projecting outward, you can more or less see how, they, how the projection works. And there's obviously an immediate problem, and that is that the, the, the poles are not can't really be part of this. And so you have to fudge that a little bit. Um, but because it was the first map to show parallels and meridians as straight lines and not curved, it was what the map makers call it had conformality, which means that you could actually draw bearings, ship bearings in straight directions. On a curved map, you have to draw them as curved lines. On a, on a, a Mercator map, you can actually draw them as straight lines. And although, you know, you probably wouldn't use a Mercator world map for uh, seafaring, uh, you can still uh, basically know what direction you have to travel to get from one particular point A to point B. Much more difficult to do that on a, on a, uh, on a curved meridian map. So um, the Mercator projection, this is the first map that he produced in, within the so-called Mercator projection. Again, it's huge, separate uh, uh, engraved blocks this time. Uh, and you can kind of see what some of the difficulties are with the Mercator. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it tends to overestimate the size of the areas to the very north and the, and the very south. Uh, and although that's a problem, that's a problem that uh, many people are willing to uh, take as long as they know what's going on. Once again, you can see the vastness of the Pacific Ocean all but missing. Um, and one of the problems is we're so used to seeing the Mercator map that these things come as a complete surprise to us. Uh, Russia is, in fact, much smaller than Africa, which it does not look like. Uh, the U.S. is vastly smaller uh, China even is smaller. Uh, obviously, all of the, all of Europe could easily fit in just the middle tier of uh, Europe. So one of the things about <clears throat> the Mercator projection is it tends to uh, minimize some of the areas around the middle of the map, including Africa. <clears throat> um, and that size distortion is the price that you have to pay basically to get what, I, what I've called uh, conformality. Um, um, again, the Mercator map suggests that the territory of R Russia is in fact far bigger than, wider than Africa, and that's not true. Uh, Africa is in fact considerably wider than Russia. Similarly, Mexico and Greenland are roughly the same size, which is uh, not the way it looks at all on the maps that we're uh, totally used to. So you have to know that you're, that this Greenland area up here is vastly distorted because of uh, the Mercator projection. Now, is that due to colonial bias, as some people say, or Eurocentric centrism? Uh, certainly there have been many attempts to recognize the distortions of the Mercator map, and we'll see that later. Um, Here's a Mercator map, and as you can see, um, it's familiar to us, but notice a couple of things. One here is that the equator is actually shifted downward, which has uh, tends to emphasize the centrality, I would say, of Europe and North America, uh, far greater than it should be. 
Uh, and obviously the size differentials here are uh, strange. Um, if you look technically over here on the right, you can see this distance, the two arrows are actually the same uh, distance on the map. So uh, there are vast distortions in terms of area on a Mercator map in order to get uh, straight meridians and straight parallels. I mentioned the golden age of maps, and indeed Vermeer happened to be living through that, and Vermeer loved maps. Uh, the maps reflected very much the wealth of the Dutch East Indies Company, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, coming into the lowlands. And uh, they also reflect the Dutch map making, which were central to the Dutch East Indi Indies Company. Uh, Simon Schama has called it the embarrassment of riches, this golden age of the low countries in terms of their Calvinist response to being rather wealthy, as well as the Protestant worth ethic uh, as well. But Vermeer so loved maps that he included nine of them in the 42 uh, known paintings of Vermeer, and they are lovingly detailed. Uh, this one on the wall <clears throat> behind is the William Blois' uh, 1621 map of Holland and West Friesland, <clears throat> with uh, uh, West at the top. And as you can say, he it almost overwhelms the two characters. It is such a, a gorgeous thing. Uh, the same map, by the way, appears in uh, The Woman in Blue Reading a Letter. Um, maps were very likely sold, actually, by Vermeer in his shop, along with works of art as well. So they, they were definitely considered works of art and therefore hung on the wall. And uh, uh, intriguing. Uh, there have been many studies on Vermeer and his uh, approach to maps in particular. Here's a question for you. What it, do, would you say is the greatest invention that basically... May, is responsible for the way the world is today. Uh, I think if we were to ask 25 people uh, randomly that question, they would name all sorts of things, but they probably wouldn't name the thing that I would name. And that is the greatest invention in the history of the world. Well, okay, I'm sorry, there's, there's the map of Friesland is in fact the joint stock corporation, uh, the shareholding companies. And these were actually created in the, around, around the year 1700 or so, 1600, I'm sorry. Um, and arguably the very first joint stock corporation, uh, it was in fact the first multinational, national, which is the Dutch East India's company. Uh, certainly one of the first, arguably the first shareholder company. Uh, this was created simply to enforce a monopoly on trade with the Far East. So it was, uh, what one historian recently has called it venture colonialism. It basically was taking uh, investor funds from strangers and you know, stockholders now were strangers uh, into a company to minimize risk and to uh, maximize the accumulation of capital, because it took major amounts of capital to do this, and they established trade routes. Uh, these companies, in particular the Dutch East Indies Company and later the uh, uh, British East Indies Company, were more powerful than governments. Uh, the Dutch East Indies Company alone sent over 1 million Europeans into Asia, uh, more than the rest of Europe combined, to establish these trade outposts. Uh, this was the beginning, very beginning of corporate capitalism. Uh, shares were actually traded on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which is a brand new uh, element. And this radically new invention, this group of persons who could act as one individual, a corporation, uh, it was like a person, but it was like an artificial person. And I believe that single invention changed the world into what we have today as much as any. Uh, the basis was, as I said, trade monopoly on goods from the East Indies. Here we have a map from the seven, around 1700 
of the East uh, Indies. And as you can see, the islands, the Moluccas and so forth, are rather emphasized here. Uh, this is not, uh, I don't think, Australia, but in fact, another island, which is, uh, I've forgotten the name of it right now, uh, New Guinea, perhaps. But uh, in any event, uh, these were, in fact, used, you can see Oost Indian up here. This is a Dutch, Dutch map. Um, uh, so great advances in the art of cartography were uh, done really to justify this, this uh, trade corporation and the Dutch East Indies companies uh, produced these maps by the hundreds. Um, here's a question for you. What's the largest value corporation of all time? Here's a trivia question for you. <laughs> and the answer is the Dutch East Indy Company. If you compare them to the current capitalized value of the 20 modern uh, largest companies, uh, they're more or less equal. So in 1637, which happens to be the year when the tulip bulb uh, valuation happened, uh, the Dutch East Indies Company had vast amounts of wealth on its on its books, and it was only chartered in, in 1602. So you can you can imagine just how much wealth uh, that actually represented. Maps were used uh, for other things now. And by the 19th century, they were actually used to express information as much as actual geography. And a very classic, beautiful early example is this uh, by this gentleman, William Smith. This is called the Geological Strata of England and Wales. He hand produced this map and uh, actually uh, came, it came to be produced by lithography one of the first maps um, done by lithography. Um, but it shows you the geological strata of, of England and Wales. He did this by going around and looking for fossils and identifying using the fossils, the age of the earth underlying it. Beautiful piece of work. Let me move a little bit faster here. This you've probably seen. Uh, this is Menard's 1869 map of the Napoleon's campaign. Here's the English version of that so you can see a little better and look at all the elements of information he's put here the width denotes the size of the army going east and the size coming back the uh, geography more or less reflects the actual uh, position on a map uh, there's a, the, the direction of the march that is uh, there's time depicted there's distance there's temperature down on the bottom all of these things put together in one single visual representation. Obviously, the major point of it is to show how much the army was decipate, decimated in its retreat from what it was originally. So this was done in uh, 1869 uh, on the campaign of 1812-1813, but it expresses beautifully a lot of different terms and uh, clearly was uh, the work of his lifetime. Uh, here we have a map of a city which didn't exist. <laughs> You'll notice there's no boundaries there for DC. This the, the, Washington was exactly a what was was a forest when this was produced. Uh, L'Enfant was told by Jefferson, the Secretary of State, to put together some modest plans for federal buildings, and L'Enfant immediately sent back a plan for a si full city on a more or less European plan. Uh, I'd ask you to mute whoever has uh, your sound on. Uh, the president's house is five times the size of the current White House, uh, which even then was the largest residence in America. So he had ambitions. And you can see the diagonals and rectangles uh, in a rather uneasy mix, but reflecting the grandeur <laughs> that was far from uh, real at the time. He put the Congress house, as he called it, on uh, Jenkins Hill at the time, which he called a pedestal wait awaiting a monument. And indeed, uh, Capitol Hill is exactly that right now. By the middle of the 19th century, slavery had come to uh, dominate the US dis uh, politics and uh, conversation. And this 
a beautiful map was produced in 1860 by the U.S. Coast Survey, a map of the slave population where uh, shading is used to represent the slave population. The, the darker the shading, the higher the number of slaves. And so you could very much visualize what areas of the South really were dependent on slavery. And as you can see, it's largely the Mississippi River, coastal Carolina, uh, Kentucky and the Appalachians are shown basically without slaves. And that was uh, interesting to the politicians at the time as, at, as well. The, uh, that map was indeed the subject of many political discussions. Here we have a painting of the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. And down here in the lower right-hand corner, you have indeed that uh, very map. Uh, so it became really quite important to the political discussion. A map um, doesn't often do that, but this one definitely had political ramifications. I mentioned that Mercator basically distorts area in order to achieve uh, angular accuracy, if you will, uh, conform conformality. Um, there are various corrections to that. And one of the more recent one was done by a man by the name of uh, 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 Peters, a, a German. And this is 1973. And he produced this map, which is supposed to correct for what he thought of as Eurocentrism. So what this is, does is distorts the shape somewhat to retain uh, equal uh, population, if you will. So the shapes are distorted now as to what they really are. You could see they were distorted in Mercator, but north and south. Here they're distorted kind of east and west to reflect indeed uh, the, 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 the world population. And Peters thought of this as taking political uh, correctness out of the world map. And he ran into all sorts of uh, uh, arguments himself that this indeed was every bit as distorting. But as you, as you can see, it did at least correct the notion that uh, you know the size of the uh, northern and southern regions are indeed uh, vastly overwhelming the interiors. And you can see the size of Africa. Uh, so, uh, this was one attempt to uh, uh, correct Mercator, but I have to tell you, all maps are distortions. So there's no, no question about that. We do have more ways to distort maps, though, as you'll see. Uh, this is a map of the ocean floor. Previous to this, maps were, uh, floors, oceans were thought to be, uh, floors were thought to be uh, flat and featureless. And a person by the name of Marie Tharp and her uh, colleague, Bruce Hazen, uh, started investing, investigating this in 1948. Uh, she, as a woman, was not allowed to go on the ships that mapped the seafloor. <laughs> and she faced all sorts of opposition. But she, in fact, is now recognized as one of the greatest cartographers of the 20th century. And uh, this map of the world seafloor was uh, produced in a uh, beautiful National Geographic issue in 1968 uh, of just the Atlantic seafloor. But as you can see, this vastly um, uh, strengthens the argument for uh, plate tectonics. You can see that the Earth is very visibly pulling apart along the seam here with the continents spreading outward. And there are also just gorgeous uh, trenches and detail. I remember very much this map in the 1968 National Geographic. And in, in preparing this, I actually found another copy on eBay and ordered it. And the map is ever bit as lovely as it was then. Uh, here's a, a close up of the, the kind of the uh, area off uh, New York. And as you can see, the loving detail that goes into each of these uh, with the, the Earth's stretch marks, if you will, uh, settled along here and uh, plains named mountains and uh, valleys and so on. Every bit as interesting and intriguing as the surface of a planet or the surface of the Earth for that matter. Um, I had a friend who uh, had this as a wall map and uh, the two of us would stare at this for hours. Um, 
And roughly the same time, 1968, uh, this is also National Geographic, uh, an issue came out with the moon. And the obvious, uh, uh, obvious new thing here is this area on the right, which is the far side of the moon, which had never been mapped before. Uh, and so this came as a revelation almost as much as the maps which suddenly depicted to Europeans uh, a new, uh, uh, previously non-existent to them, continent uh, in, in the Americas. And as you can see, uh, the two sides are actually reasonably different. <laughs> uh, over here on the left, the side that we see towards us, you can see vast areas of uh, volcanic flow, basalt, that's why it's a little darker. This is the Sea of Serenity. Uh, down just below it is the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, we have Galileo to thank for those gorgeous names. Uh, but none of that really exists over on the far side of the moon. And I can tell you ever since then, uh, geologists have been uh, trying to figure out precisely why. And that conversation is still ongoing. Uh, basically, I think the uh, more or less accepted theory is that these are lava flows, which uh, for some reason didn't only happen in this area and not on this area, which may have had to do with the reason why the moon is gravitationally locked so that we only see uh, one version of it. But in any event, this all of these maps happened in the late 60s together, and it was a, <laughs> a time when basically the, the National Geographic became one of the most interesting magazines uh, ever. Uh, there's uh, where the uh, eagle landed at the bottom of the Sea of Tranquility, just on the edge. Uh, up until the 60s, we all thought the world looked something like this, a conventional globe, a relief map. And of course, we discovered that in fact, it was quite different. It was, it's covered in uh, lovely white swirls of clouds. And uh, again, this came as a massive revelation, Earthrise, as it's called, uh, our planet uh, does not look like we expected, at least as I expected it. And uh, and you can almost not make out the landforms because the clouds overwhelm it. And that's uh, a reminder of how uh, unimportant uh, geographic uh, distinctions are, uh, uh, political distinctions are uh, that uh, divide our map, uh, if you want to use it that way. Uh, maps are used for political purposes all, all the time. And uh, yeah, this is 1968, the same time that we were seeing the bottom of the ocean for the first time and seeing the far side of the moon for the first time. Uh, maps used for political purposes. The whole distinction between red versus blue, which actually is a convention which only dates to the year 2000, the election of 2000. Prior to that, we didn't have red states and blue states, at least in the, in the, the uh, discussion, the political discussion. So maps tend to convey the information that you want. The 2020 presidential district votes by area. And as you can see, quite a lot of it is red, actually. If you size the congressional districts, though, and give each congressional district the same amount of uh, space, it looks more like this. So uh, the Republicans obviously look at one map and the Democrats uh, uh, look at another. But the... Uh, the important thing is this, that the number of districts indeed was uh, majority blue, not, not red, as you might suggest. A version of this map on the left, actually county by county, so it showed even more red, uh, was on the wall in the West Wing during, uh, during the Trump administration. So basically proving that they had more or less overwhelmingly won the election. <laughs> there is, so apart from that, that political purpose, there is a... Um, a website which I, I, I strongly recommend you go to. It's called world, worldmapper.org, uh, I think it is. It might be edu. In any event, this is this is the home page, and you can go on it and just, if you're uh, like me, <laughs> have all sorts of fun looking at uh, various things. This is a map they called a map of the Anthropocene, which is the geological era that supposedly we're in right now because of the fact that man has had a, an effect on the environment. 
What they've done here is to distort the area based on population. Uh, and so again, the uh, overpopulated areas are stretched and the underpopulated areas are uh, all but non-existent. You can see the Sahara here is basically a missing band and parts of the Amazon are, are not there. Um, but in addition to that, they show the sea routes on the sea floor of uh, the uh, uh, trade routes. And they also show in a slightly less color the map of the uh, transmission lines, the pipe uh, information pipelines on the information grid going from place to place. So this is an expression of the way man has essentially come to inhabit the earth, if you will. Uh, the green earth is now basically distorted based on man's population and, uh, and industry and uh, commercial environment. So lots of uh, interesting maps uh, on that website that I recommend uh, looking at. I mentioned that there are lots of projections and there are some that are really quite good. This is uh, an example of what's called an interrupted map, which means that they basically cut the map into pieces reflecting the land masses so that uh, uh, you can see more or less the continents and the shapes and they are uh, more or less they're the same in, in their appropriate uh, scale and perspective but the uh, map is cut apart so that you can see the continents ex expressed that way. Uh, there are other options uh, with a computer. You can actually do lots of different things. Uh, this is uh, a butterfly map, as it's called. And as you can see, if you put, to get, put it together, you more or less have a, a globe. And this manages to put all of the land masses, the major land masses, uh, more or less in a long string with the poles at the ends of that uh the sections uh here's an with uh, a hexagon version looking at it for with the north pole as centered uh here is <laughs> they call it chase lounge uh conformal and again conformal means that the uh meridians are all straight not curved basically uh, unlike uh, all of the others shown here so managed to be both conformal and this um, <laughs> amazing shape, which you can, in fact, if you wish to, cut out, put together in the form of more or less a globe. Lots of uh, things to play with. There are literally hundreds of different projections right now, and some of them quite beautiful uh, on their own as, uh, as works of art. So I'm more or less at the end, and I can't end this without mention of one of the most famous maps of all time <laughs> one of my favorites as well uh the view from the world of the world from uh, ninth avenue saul steinberg okay with that let me open it up uh two questions i'm uh, happy to respond to any questions you have and i also by the way i put my email there for a reason if you want to either send questions or comments to me by email i uh will uh Welcome that opportunity. So let me see if we have, oh, we have quite a few in chat. Okay. All right. First question is, what evidence exists? Or Let me see here. Was found to permit a lost map to be reconstructed. Okay, we basically have the coordinates. Um, that's how we reconstruct Ptolemy's map. Uh, Ptolemy listed, as I said, 7,000 uh, locations with their numeric uh, coordinates so that they could, in fact, uh, a map could be created. We just don't have any actual maps from that era. Even today, Portuguese is still spoken east of that line in Spanish West of it. That's exactly right. Brazil is Portuguese because of that Treaty of Torcidas. Since Europeans had traveled to China by land, didn't they know the approximate size of Asia enough to realize that given the early estimates of the Earth's circumference, that there must be a lot more ocean than they were drawing. They were indeed aware of Marco Polo's journey, but they had no idea. Marco Polo was not a geographer and did not compute latitude and longitude. So they had really no idea of size or the vastness of, of Asia. That was all just a guess. 
Uh, interesting to see America and Caribbean islands. Okay, I think that's referring to the Waldsee Miller. What is known of the people who collected the data from which the earliest map makers worked? Well, there were sailors, basically, and they had more or less modern sailing equipment. They did most of their data collection on board ship. Uh, they didn't do a lot of work on land until much later when, when the populations were, were higher. And you really have to have surveyor's equipment to do an accurate map. And it, I can tell you, it's it's quite difficult. Uh, the mapping of places like uh, the Himalayas uh, really was a major effort on the part of the British Empire. Uh, William Smith, obviously, didn't, okay, did I have typo? 1939, yeah, okay, apologize, 1839. Uh, I think this was the first graphical depiction of data uh, I'm not sure, but actually the Ptolemy's map, I would call the first graphical depiction of data. Please check your slide of William Smith mis misstates the date of death, okay? The circles were intended as rally points for government troops in the event of an insurrection. That's uh, L'Enfant's map. Uh, that is one conjecture. I will tell you, uh, <laughs> Jefferson was not particularly happy with the map. He, he said, you know, I told you just to do a couple of buildings and you did this whole map of the city. Uh, Washington was more happy, and he basically suggested that it was a useful uh, map. And surprisingly, it has actually been followed more or less, even though it was a total visionary uh, dream, really, at the time. I may have missed the map that originally showed North America as it is today. Uh, I'm not sure about that. The, the mapping of the western parts of North America were really quite light, not until uh, probably the... Uh, 17th century or so. I recommend a book by Marie Tharp. Thank you. Uh, I will definitely uh, toss that in as well. I've not read it, but uh, I definitely uh, will look at, look for it now. Uh, the ocean floor map really demonstrates why it's so difficult to locate sunk, sunken ships. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, difficult to locate sunken, ship, sunken ships for other reasons as well. But uh, let's see. Why all these map shapes not not practical? Well, <laughs> people love maps and they love to uh, uh, play with them, and, and uh, everyone comes up with a new one and the hopes that it will become popular. Uh, I'm the one. Well, Kim Bryce says I'm the one that first created the first red blue map in 1986. That was the opposite two of the three networks at the time. That was opposite two of the three networks at the time. I guess the red blue convention. Our our every year two year election result poster maps by county have switched conventional wisdom so that everyone knows that red is Republican and blue is Democrat. Okay, uh, Kim Bryce, thank you for that comment. Interesting. Uh, how is AI influencing cartography? Somebody went to my last class, I guess. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I I'm not aware that it has yet, but it probably certainly will. Uh, my email address, okay, that I gave it again, it's M-A-N-T-E-U-F at Verizon.net. Um, thank you all for the comments. Uh, I love paper maps when travel, not Google Maps on my phone or my car. Yes, <laughs> I sympathize with you. I'm the one here. I, I also miss those AAA uh, maps as well. Uh Hoping you would say a bit about military topographic maps. So, wow, okay, sorry. And the development over time in the last 50, 100 years ago from Charles Ostlott. Ostlott, Ostlott, I beg your pardon, Charlie. Um, I didn't cover that and I don't actually know much about it. So, uh, a good comment. Could you please discuss the influence of the Babylonians who used a base 60 numerical system? Okay, I, I'm not sure I mentioned that. I should have. The reason why we have 360 degrees. And the reason why there are 360 degrees in a circle is uh, the Babylonians uh, counted that way. Um, uh, we did not have 360 degrees of uh, long, uh, latitude until uh, much later, but uh, 360 degrees makes sense in both cases. And it is a bit of an odd number and you can thank the Babylonians indeed. Uh, thank you, let's see. What was the predominant method for determining the outline footprint of the land masses? It's fascinating to see how close some of the maps were. Indeed, I am amazed at that as well. Uh, basically, as I say, they really just, in order to sail, you have to know pretty much where you are. 
and you have tools for doing that, you know, sextant and so on. Uh, I didn't mention, but latitude uh, was, was easy to compute from the stars. Longitude was much more difficult until the invention of an accurate shipboard chronometer. I think you most, most of you know that story. Um, but latitude and longitude were computed continuously so that ships could know where they were. Given that, it wasn't too difficult to add uh, map uh, information to that. Okay, first jigsaw puzzles by John Spilsbury were made with a purpose to instruct kids on geography. There's a factoid for you. Thank you, David Kane, for that comment. How can the Arctic be mapped if the ice flows are always moving? Uh, well, the parts that are moving that are indeed temporary from year to year usually aren't uh, aren't mapped. Uh, but uh, an astonishing part of it of is permanent ice flow, which uh, the ice shelves shelves are indeed mappable. Um, but uh, flows themselves typically aren't. Um, thank you all for the comments. Okay, I think we are out of questions unless somebody wants to raise a hand and be recognized. We have just a couple more minutes. Uh, there is a hand, two hands raised now. Uh, David Kane, go ahead and unmute, please. Yeah, I mean, I think I probably knew the answer to this, one, but I assume there are probably still many uncharted islands, right? Uh, sorry, say that again. Are there still uncharted islands? Uh, charted, in the world? Uncharted islands? Um, I don't know about that. I'm not aware of any. There, there are, uh, of course, they wouldn't be on the maps if they were. There are uninhabited islands, um, but uh, I'm not sure there are any uh, that uh, have yet to be, that, that, are, that are still terra incognita. <laughs> It'd be nice to think there are. Okay, Mr. Gold, uh, go ahead and unmute, please. Yeah, one, I thought one of the interesting things about maps and, and about the Earth was the fact that uh, the date line the international dateline, and after Magellan's first, his ship's circumnavigation of the Earth, and they couldn't figure out why they arrived when they arrived when it was a day late. <laughs> well, uh, Magellan, by the way, uh, I didn't mention this. He, he didn't make it. He didn't circumnavigate right. the Earth. Yeah, one of his crew members did, but. Uh, the time zones obviously weren't weren't really a thing until the 19th century when uh, railroads actually imposed the need for them. And th therefore, the dateline uh, came into effect at that uh, point as well. Uh, so time zones and the dateline, I, I think, are relatively modern. Um, I doubt if they would have been of much interest to the folks uh, who, you know, were the first to really cross it. Um, but... Uh, an interesting problem. Thank you for the comment. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.